All right, over in the NFL, Drew Locke back from COVID-19 this week, and the quarterback competition is still on in Seattle. Pete Carroll doesn't seem to be rushing that decision when it comes to QB1. Locke was supposed to start against the Bears, but missed, of course, after testing positive. As for Geno Smith, he failed to lead when it comes to those scoring drives in seven possessions. Ultimately, a missed opportunity for the longtime backup. When it comes to the head coach, Pete Carroll, taking all the time he needs to make a decision on that starting job. Gino's been the guy in the lead position the whole time, and I protected that thought with, uh, you know, throughout. And, and he's done a really nice job. He's been very consistent. Um, so we'll just see what happens. And, and you know, there's two more weeks of practice too after this. So there's where the timeline. I had a set thought on the you know, what we would do with the timeline, but that got disrupted. And so um, we're, you know, we're going to use all the time we need. Would you ever consider playing two quarterbacks at once? Or is it Th that can happen. Yeah, that can happen. All right, NFL expert Tyler Sullivan checking in here with us on HQ this morning. And Pete Carroll there taking his time when it comes to QB1. That decision still out there. Said either Locke Smith or Hinton, maybe both at this point. Uh, Russell Wilson is not coming back through this door. So what's the latest on that competition there? Yeah, I don't know what the what he would be thinking if all of a sudden Drew Locke is getting one series and Geno Smith is getting another. I don't. I think he's just kind of brushing it off, keeping himself ambiguous when he says, "Yeah, that could happen." I don't really foresee a scenario where all of a sudden you're seeing both of these quarterbacks playing in some capacity in Week One. But like he said, I do think that the timeline of making this decision got a little bit derailed because of Drew Locke getting COVID-19 for a minute. There, it kind of felt like he was gaining on Geno Smith. He played better than Smith, in my opinion, in the opener even though he was playing in the second half, which obviously you got to throw a caveat in there because of the level of talent that's playing in the second half of a preseason game. But he was projected to get the start. He was working with the ones in practice leading up to that second preseason game, but obviously missed it due to COVID-19. I'm curious to see what kind of run he gets in the finale here, because if all of a sudden he starts working with the ones and it looks better than what we've seen with Geno Smith, it's not like Geno Smith has the pedigree in the back, back with all to all of a sudden say, you know what, we're going to still go with the guy that we've known for the past few years here in Seattle. Let's try something new. Maybe our ceiling's a little bit higher with Drew Locke. So again, I feel like this is one of the rare instances where this competition could very much come to that final preseason game this week. Of course, Drew Locke coming over from Denver in that trade with Russ in that AFC West. And speaking of that division, Chargers J.C. Jackson, he'll miss two to four weeks after undergoing surgery on his ankle, maybe the silver lining, he hasn't played a snap in preseason, so maybe they're prepared for this. However, how will this kind of impact that defense out the gate here? Yeah, it's really interesting when you start talking about the timeline with J.C. Jackson. Obviously, a super impact player, signed a massive deal with them this offseason coming from New England. You look at those interception totals. I mean, he leads the NFL since coming into the league with 25 of them. He is a very opportunistic type of player. He's going to be a huge impact to that Los Angeles defense, along with Cleo Mack helping on the pass rush as well. But the timing is less than ideal, especially when you start to look at their scheduled to begin the year. Obviously, they start out week one on September 11th, but then they have a short week. They play on Thursday night football against Kansas City in week two. So if all of a sudden, you know, it, we say two to four weeks in terms of a return from an ankle injury like this, but you still need that ramp up period. Like we said, he hasn't played in the preseason. Maybe that helps. Maybe he's been, you know, fresh behind the scenes and stuff like that. But ultimately, there is going to be some sort of ramp up period. And do they really want to bring this guy back on a short week if he's unable to play in the open? Opener, then you're starting to talk about missing the first two weeks of the season. It's certainly concerning for a team like the Chargers who are in a super competitive division in the AFC West. And you have a division opponent right there in the Kansas City Chiefs who you're going to be fighting against all season long to get in that top spot in the division along with the Broncos and the Raiders. So yes, less than ideal time for a guy that they are picking to be a pillar to that secondary alongside Derwin James at safety. Uh, meanwhile, the Commanders, they're not in a competitive division. The NFC East has been terrible for years. Uh, they had to play Chase Young on that reserve pub list Tuesday, but still leave him unavailable for the, at least the first four games of the season. How does that kind of impact that pass rush that actually took a step back last year compared to what we saw in his rookie year? Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, it was a huge step back from winning the Defensive Rookie of the Year. Kind of felt like he was going to be that generational type of talent that comes into the league at the pass rushing position, coming as a number two overall pick. And that sophomore campaign, even before the ACL tear against the Buccaneers, it just wasn't the same. It just didn't, you know, that whole defense felt like they were getting gashed 
every single week, whether it be on the ground or through the air. And so Chase Young, this one, I, I don't know if it's as jarring as, say, a J.C. Jackson absence, simply because they've been planning for this. This is not something that's come out of left field, like an injury that ha- occurs during camp. Ron Rivera even noted on the radio earlier this offseason that this was probably the likely outcome. This was something that was trending that way. So again, not a huge you know, swing in terms of the for, for the commanders because they knew that this was going to happen. They knew they were going to miss out on this, on this timetable, but still less than ideal because you have two winnable games out of the gate against the Jaguars and the, and the Detroit Lions. I feel like you could win those two games and then the final two games of his potential four game absence or at least the minimum of the games that he's going to miss come in the division against the Philadelphia Eagles and the Dallas Cowboys. So if you had any hopes of trying to be a sleeper and contend with Carson Wentz as your quarterback, you're going to really have to show out on these first four weeks here because you're not going to have your star defensive player against two winnable games and then two division games. So from a scheduling standpoint, it's less than ideal for them. For the earliest he can come back, October 9th against the Tennessee Titans. We'll see how that happens for the commanders here. Tyler Sullivan and Guinness all on the same page, page and paper. Pen and paper, let me say it right there. Uh, Pick 6 paper, Podcast. Paper. Page, paper, pep, piper, paper, all that stuff. Will Brinson and RJ White, they go through the bets and something you might want to look at when it comes to home field advantage, the NFL future bets as well. Download, give him a follow. Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.